So after spending three years with the directive on the service of the audiovisual, but we're now have reached the point where we can look at outlooks at our final panel discussion with six guests who will come to sit around the table as we speak. Madeleine de Cogbinning, Vice President of Public Policy for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa for Netflix. And Delphine Emmert, President of France Television and the European Union for Radio Television. The Director General of Media and Cultural Industries, Jean-Baptiste Gourdin from the Ministry of Culture. Gudni Himmelyal, President of the European Producers Club and the President of the European Group of Regulators for Audiovisual Media Services, uh, Karim Iburki and Rock Olivier Mestre, President of the Authority for the Regulation of Digital Audiovisual Communication. This roundtable meeting is led by the Director General of the Institute for Financing Cinema and Cultural Institutes, Karim. Over to you, Karim, for this discussion. Thank you so much. So we're here for the final panel discussion today. The two previous panels covered two important topics, protecting strategic assets and definition of European works. These are two topics we'll not be covering, even though they're closely linked to the AVMS Directive. Uh, to quickly cover the different uh, topics to be angled with within the framework of the AVMS Directive, let me cover some points of interest to us at this round table. I hope I won't be repeating what was said this morning, but first of all, France transposed the AVMS Directive and set up texts covering obligations stemming from this directive. We may judge it as being more or less rapid. Some have uh, expressed their views on that. But nevertheless, the directive that dates back to the 14th of November 2018 was transposed into French law quite rapidly by the decree of the 21st of December 2020 and the final translation by the decree of the 22nd of June 2021. So following the path quite uh, rapidly, and this is something that we'll be talking about today at European level, all countries haven't followed the same pathway or at the same pace, because we may consider, if I look at my last count, out of the 27 European countries, 16 have not transposed anything in terms of the financial obligations anyway. The main principles of the directive, I won't bore you with this, but there are two main principles that were adopted on broadcasting European works, 30% minimum, that was uh, spoken of a bit earlier today. And also, what's of greater interest to us is the possibility of imposing financial obligations for producing audiovisual and cinematographic works. A few general principles. First of all, a financial contribution may be imposed. Secondly, and, it's quite, and this is impactful, the country of destination, the countries of destination imposed the financial obligation of this work on the previous round table on European works. We can see that we have set up a hybrid system where sometimes you have uh, the country of origin and sometimes it's the country of destination that is chosen. I don't know if there will be any comments on that. And lastly, all of these obligations are meaningless without control, control that is entrusted in the hands of national regulators. And here we have the French national regulator and the president of the Association of European Regulators. The transposition, as I said before, with respect to financial obligations is more or less partial in different European countries. 16 have done nothing, but for those who have done something, about 10 or 11, the rates applied are very significantly when you look at the table, because it reaches from a rate of 1.5% uh, in some countries 
At first sight, it seems to be quite little, and rates that may reach up to 20 to 25 percent for the two countries that are in the lead, meaning France and Italy. The actual fact for France is quite simple. The mechanism, there is not, no equivalent in Europe. The platforms, as far as we are concerned, will invest 20% of the revenue in creation and the 20, after the 20%, 80% for the visual and 20% for the cinema. So to summarize, 4% of revenue for cinema production and 16% for audiovisual visual production. To talk about real money, you should point out that all of this could account for 250 to 300 million euros for national creation. These are amounts that are quite significant. I believe that France television is going even beyond that. Canal Plus, for example, is injecting large amounts. But the last agreement with Canal Plus, if I'm not mistaken, we spoke a lot about that recently, represents about 200 or 250 to 300 millions per year in addition. That is a huge amount indeed. To illustrate the fact that this is a burning issue, so to speak, France didn't stop there on the 21st of June 2021. There are other texts, other legislations uh, finalizing the system, some on the 31st of December 2021. With that born you, there was an, the Katsa decree on Hertzian channels. And furthermore, there is a, a text with the media chronology for France, which is a burning topic in France, and it was signed with Netflix, one of the major platforms, yesterday with a system that was negotiated and accepted by all the participants, the Netflix, the platforms, 15 months after a theatrical release and Canal Plus now 60, six months after theatrical release. So we are fortunate to have almost all the stakeholders in the system with the state and the public authority represented by Jean-Baptiste Bernard and the national regulator, well, the Association of European Regulators and representatives of public and economic players in the sector. So I believe that the, you can all express your views about the system. What we'll try not to do is to transform this debate into a technical debate with, full of jargon with uh, topics that we're not all familiar with and not to cover questions such as uh, European works. What this is essential is to try to take a first stock of the transposition in France of this directive to broaden the scope at the European level and to see if we can anticipate on the practical effects of this transposition, bearing in mind that, as you said before, the ink is barely dry for some degree. So it's a bit complicated to say that we will embark upon uh, outlooks and what we can do next, since we're talking about a text that changes very little. And it has just been drawn up. So I now give the floor to Jean-Baptiste Gourda, who will certainly explain what took place in France, at any rate, for us to finalize the system. Thank you, Karim, and hello, everyone. I will be focusing on the way we transposed Article 13 of the AVMS Directive on the financial contributions. In French law, to speak about investment obligations, the AVMS directive is quite different. The other important issues that I may speak about further on. But Article 13, you must understand that as opposed to other articles in the directive, it creates no obligations incumbent upon member states. It gives you a faculty, the faculty of imposing investment obligations on broadcasters, television channels, or audiovisual on demand. And when you choose a financial contribution, the service abroad or in another member state is must comply with it when it targets the state in question. That is a key principle in the AVMS directive, the notion of the country of origin, a fundamental difference with what was said about distribution quotas. We have not a faculty, but an obligation. There must be at least 30% 
and the principle is that of the country of origin. So two fundamental differences in the two mechanisms that I may come back to later on. So Article 13 gives a lot of room to maneuver to states in how they transport the directive, and this is why our panel is interesting to compare radically different choices made from one state to another. Why did France get so mobilized around Article 13? Two main reasons. To have a sustainable financial system, it was in jeopardy because it did not cover the major global platforms that played an increasingly important role in our ecosystem. And it was essential to have competitive fairness between national and foreign players operating on the same board. We didn't know it at the time, but it was essential as the health crisis amplified the situation by calling in jeopardy the advertising revenue from traditional uh, media and accelerating the acceptance of European audiences in France in particular of the new forms of, cons of uh, produce, production and consumption of individual works. This applies not only to financial contributions but for taxes. France did not wait for the AVMS directive because taxes were up to services operating abroad. So we already applied the principle of the country of destination. What were the issues in this transposition from our perspective in France? With the risk of surprising you, the issue was not about forcing global or American platforms to invest in local production. I believe that Madeleine could confirm this, but platforms did not wait for the SMAT directive or AVMS to invest in France or in Europe. They understood that it was their benefit from an economic standpoint. Their clients wanted this, and they were starting to do this and would do it anyway. It was really about rooting that investment strategy so that it could be lasting because a powerful player could very well start to, by investing in local creation and then decide to change the strategy and to refocus investments on works formatted for a global audience. And more fundamentally, the goal was less a matter of forcing them to invest than to setting a framework for investments to make them compliant with our public policies. I will give you three examples. First of all, to ensure diversity in creation. Linguistic diversity, of course, with the notion of quota of works of French expression, and also types of program, budget. Uh, works with a small, large budget, for example, to summarize, the issue was to see to it that investment would be beneficial for audiovisual fictions and, also, and series, but also cinema, meaning uh, movies in the theater and documentaries and so on. Secondly, protect the independence of our creation by earmarking these investments for independent production, as we call it in France. Our definition in France is different. It's not just a capitalistic independence from the, this, from the broadcaster. In many conditions linked to the notion of a delegated producer, criteria with respect to uh, distribution rights, and to see to it that European distributors would not just become suppliers of platforms, but can continue to constitute their assets, which is are essential for restaking. And then we have our concept of copyright in the French sense or the European sense, meaning remuneration is compensation to the buyout model. In just a few words now, if you have a, if I have a few minutes left, I'd like to insist on some structuring choices that impacted the transposition. We decided to rebalance our investment obligations. We didn't only extend existing rules to foreign players as we could have, 
the AVMS directed and forced us to revamp everything, but we decided to revamp everything. And in 2021, we reviewed it all with the three degrees. Thirdly, the choice of a high level of financing, creation, creative works in two areas. First of all, rates, as you said, that are comparatively high in the SMAT decree as compared to other European states and as compared to pre-existing rates for players using TNT. So this choice wasn't based on taxation for foreign players or to give preference to national players over foreign kind, foreign players, but it was about the specificity in terms of economic model. The 20-25% is a high rate, but see it in relative terms. I, this Alain de Birderda explained that with a rate of 20%, for a player like Netflix, I'm sorry, Madeleine, but I will use this example that everyone is familiar with. That means, with respect to the 17 billion euros in investment and creations, accounts for just 1% of the global investment by Netflix in creation each year. Whereas French subscribers, if I'm not mistaken, we're talking about 4% of French subscribers around the world, and in terms of contribution to your revenue, a bit more, I believe. So we're not talking about something that is disproportionate or e not economically viable. It is still a good amount, 300 million euros, as you said, Karim, 20% more than existing financing, and we did not lower the financial contributions by historical players. That was held against us, as a matter of fact, but we considered that choosing a Malthusian perception, considering that by lowering the obligations of traditional players by increasing new financing, would be deadly over the long term. Because our conviction is that it is indispensable for so-called traditional media, it's not a very appropriate term, channels and free or pay TV should remain a pillar in our financing model for cultural diversity, we need a plurality of financiers for creation and free access to culture, because it's not France's success that works are reserved for pay platforms or for cultural sovereignty. It's not a good idea for funding our criteria, our, our creations to be dependent only on global platforms. A third. Uh, structural choice. We, in the SMAT TNT decrees, we have different rules because it was a matter of fairness. That doesn't mean treating everyone the same way, but taking differences into account. And the huge differences between types of uh, services, the territorial footprint, if it's for France or global, differences in the editorial nature. It's not the same thing when you have a service proposing only movies or audiovisual works and one that is more general, like a TV channel with sports uh, and entertainment. So the rates are different, and that's normal. Or works that are made available in a content, or if you have a program grid with time constraints. I won't go into the technical constraints. You ask us not to do so. But there are many differences in all degrees, and yet we simplified. It may make you smile for those who read the decree. It is still a bit complex, but simplification in that we try to refer more to professional negotiations and the regulations. This is a skillful transition before Rock Olivier Messre takes the floor. We did that not for ideology, but fundamentally. We are talking about different players with models that evolve a lot. They can change their editorial model or business model from one day to the next, and ha having everything enshrined in regulations would be impossible. We try to enable each broadcaster to negotiate with the representatives of production and with regulators' rules suited to their own specific features leading to an additional decree setting default rules that may be set aside in some cases 
with a lot of possibilities for um, modulation by agreement. In other words, tailor-made instead of ready to wear. Thank you so much, Jean-Baptiste. It's very clear indeed. The political will was there, and it's very well summarized. I note that the goal was to reach a balance, strike a balance in terms of fairness between the different players, and supporting access to free, diverse, uh, audiovisual in all forms, so important for France, and independence as in the title of the symposium. The national regulators had a very broad and complex assignment to strike that balance. And uh, we are wondering about how ARCOM was able to carry out these complex negotiations and we're also wondering about the means of control over these obligations. Now that we have an intent, we make, must make sure that it is implemented. And lastly, the articulations between national and European regulators, because these obligations are national, of course, but in, in terms of the country of destination, country of origin, it makes it all very complex relating to control, data, for example. I imagine that this is a matter that is at the heart of uh, your concerns, Mr. Mestre. Yes, thank you, Jean-Baptiste, for speaking about the regulator intensely, because in terms of regulations and legislations, regulators are far from being absent, because the um, regulators have changed their name, but not only, they've changed the scope. and the scope of competence significantly as compared to the past. Moving on from what John baptiste said, we did take part in every step of the process. Regulation today, and Karin will say this better than I can, is now very much European in scope. We took part in the genesis of the modernization of the directive, first of all, drawing up the AVMS directive and then its transposition with our, uh, our opinion being handled, handed down on the text. And then implementing this text from two perspectives. First of all, at the left of the European group of regulators, with our Irish counterparts, we drafted a memorandum of understanding, which is an important document in implementing the uh, ABM is directive. Regulators must have an homogeneous approach. With this text, with our partners, we adopted this memorandum, implementing a rule of the game so that the exchange of information between regulators will be done swiftly and fluidly because we will need that dimension. Information must circulate amongst us, and our interpretation of the text should be homogeneous. And at national level, of course, in light of our uh, mandate, we carried out a concrete and swift transposition of the document with an agreement reached in December last year so as not to miss out on the deadline for 2021, because each year matters when it comes to creation. So the three most important uh, AVMS, Netflix, of course, the main contributor, Amazon and Disney, followed by others that are being set up. I'm thinking of Canal Plus, ECS, and other smaller players in view of the financial challenges, but covered by the mechanism. The choice we made was by agreement, and that's in the spirit of the decree. The, the, even though it allows us to notify obligations if an agreement cannot be reached. We opted for agreements to bring in these major players in our funding mechanism for creation in an agreement-based approach to avoid a litigations-based approach. And these agreements show the players will, and John Baptiste was right to stress this, and our representative from Netflix may say this, was to be in a model of funding French creation 
and being part of a very special ecosystem as the one we have in France. This mechanism will lead to a contribution to the extent of 20% of revenue generated in France by these operators. We'll have an estimate of the full year, and the year is now in progress. We estimated that between 250 and 300 million euros, a large amount that in addition, as Jean-Baptiste said, is not as a replacement, but in addition, and these amounts will grow because other platforms have already announced their intent. We know this, HBO Max for broadcasting in France. It has already been announced probably at the start of next year. And this is a period we will give the dynamism of these platforms, be either a number of uh, subscribers. Disney came in France quite recently. Or by increasing their rates, we can see that Netflix's policy contains a very significant rise in tariffs. So to be a dynamic base, so 250 to 300 million is a figure that will evolve rapidly over the years. So 20% for cinema, 80% for the visual, that breakdown may evolve. Jean-Baptiste noted that in the regulations as implemented, uh, there is some room for flexibility. The agreements we sign were signed for three-year periods, which is a short term to take into account the unavoidable changes with the arrival of new platforms and changes in the format of those platforms. They will be enriched due to strong competition amongst themselves, and their offer will certainly evolve. 20% for cinema, the two things, 80% for the visual, 95% of funds for the visual will be in for fiction, documentary, animation, and 75% for original French works. The decree will enable a modulation in a range that will be slower, lower, or slightly higher. That is what we agreed upon after speaking with the platforms, bearing in mind that these platforms exist outside of France initially, and they have an obligation to show 20% of European works today. So the AVMS directive that's European, it's all about protecting French authors and creators, but it's also a European regulation that is there to defend an European cultural exception. We took that into account as well. A third dimension that we took into account relates to diversity with uh, particular clauses that we find and we don't sy systematically find with our national players. That is to be noted. Each platform must abide by two diversity clauses, either in favor of documentation or animation or living spectacles. And this is the first time this is the case for Amazon that it has an obligation of diversity when it comes to living spectacles. So we wanted to show uh, this the ambition of this text and to be kind of rapidly, not to miss out on 2021. And also, it was all about following the great French tradition of interprof interprofessional negotiations that will be, case, will be the case for cinema. We notified the obligation to these platforms because one important thing that's missing, the media chronology, that led to long negotiations, and this has now been signed, been signed. So we reached an agreement on cinema. Netflix typically signed the media chronology mechanisms, and its agreement with it will be adjusted to take into account parameters on cinema that applies to cinema channels and diversity clauses on cinema. So we told the platforms, and we told the trade unions in question that when it comes to audiovisual negotiations, as was always the case in the sector, must be carried out as well to see how we could improve on the agreements and to keep this agreement alive. So this was an important phase as well for regulators, as Jean-Baptiste said. This is what is new in the approach. 
we pleaded in favor of this, we advocated this at the time when things changed very quickly. It is important for regulators, it may sound self-evident, but for them to have the power to regulate and regulations, but leave some room for regulation. And I think that is very important in all the texts that were enacted last year to introduce the ability to be flexible in regulations while uh, leaving room for interprofessional negotiations. So it's more flexible. It sets a legislative and uh, regulatory framework and architecture providing for interprofessional dialogue, but giving flexibility to regulators to take into account a changing world. This is a key step for the sector, and I would like to stress today that this step, at present, has no equivalent in Europe with respect to the contribution rates in regulations implemented. And um, there were criticisms made of regulators, but let me remind you that the mechanism signed, the fruit of negotiations with players, is not the regulator who set up the rules on his own. There were negotiations with partners, and the outcome is something that has no equivalent anywhere else in Europe, even though our Italian friends are probably those who are the closest to this mechanism. But this is far different from what you find in other countries. Thank you so much. Apparently, the French system, with a full uh, set of tools, and all the texts were transposed within the time frame indicated. As you said in your introduction, we can see that at European level, we have different domains. And I'm saying this by memory. I think it's 5% for Spain, 2.5% for Germany. And amongst the major uh, countries for the movies, we're talking about clearly lower amounts. And I wanted to uh, to talk with the uh, uh, with the boss of uh, Belgium uh, because uh, because it is. It is the regulating unit, so there is a powerful role behind that. The Memorandum of Understanding, which was uh, mentioned before of December 2003, is particularly structuring uh, within that. But I was, uh, uh, I was uh, wondering, what is the role of the ergot uh, within the uh, uh, transposition, uh, this uh, French model? Is it possible to take it over with the uh, in the neighbor countries? Why do we have uh, uh, those countries uh, who are a little bit late? And um, uh, Roc Olivier Mestre has mentioned that uh, that uh, the er uh, Erga having a, this very um, difficult mission uh, to uh, uh, to carry. Do do you really have the possibility to? to fulfill this mission. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Karim. There are, we have the same name. It's funny. Um, just to react to what Roque Olivier said, what we have implemented in France is a model. Um, you also mentioned that in your introduction. Today, there are only half of the member countries of the EU uh, who are going to to implement this article uh, to 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 transpose the uh, the the article dedicated to the contribution, this contribution to uh, creation and European independence, etc. This way of doing things is not necessarily shared by all the member countries. And what has been obtained during. The, 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 when, when this directive w was voted is particularly important. Let's go back and remember uh, that, because we are talking about things that we consider as being obvious, but it was not for a long time. It had to be negotiated. So the system is a victory in itself. And what has been negotiated in France is also a kind of benchmark uh, compared with all the things that may happen in Europe. I would like to uh, give a local example. 
I have been, uh, as the president of the Belgian CSR, uh, I have been uh, questioned yesterday uh, about um, the percentages that uh, were accepted at the French level. And, um, and 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 what had been accepted by the French CSR. So I have been questioned about that for Belgium. So you see that the whole system is developing. It's not obvious, but it's still young. So how are we going to check the uh, the, the 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 real compliance uh, within the club of those countries who have decided to transpose Article 13? Well. We're going to check that. It's a little bit too early to talk about an assessment because some countries are a little bit late and uh, with the uh, transposition and integration of the whole directive. So it's going to be um, um, doing by uh, working and uh, it's still in more or less in the pipeline. But what we can say today is that for those countries who decided to transpose, We will have to be also very careful about the devil and hidden in the details. We will have to check the right exchange of information. We have mentioned several times now the Memorandum of Understanding, and it is particularly important to exchange with those countries where the platforms are present, be it uh, in Belgium or in France. We have ongoing discussions uh, with Netflix and with our uh, uh, with our um, uh, colleagues from Holland, because uh, Netflix settled down in Holland, in the Netherlands, so we we will have to check all that. But we also have to take a look at the way the market is going to structure itself. Five years ago, we had this explosion of. Uh, accessibility, availability of platforms, and to react to uh, to what had been said at that time, we will have to make sure that uh, the, the, the French public keeps uh, available, um, an, an available space in their minds um to pay uh, attention to the, uh, the 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 creativity so we will have to check on that we will have to observe the way this market is going to be structured we are not protected from uh, from a, a, a disruption on on the market uh, because of actors like facebook and others and delphine ernot I can very well imagine that two years ago you were not very happy when Amazon negotiated the purchase of the uh, of the uh, uh, broadcasting of Roland Garros, uh, where when when France Television had been in charge of that uh, uh, broadcasting for years and years and years. So you see that we are not protected. The market may disrupt when a newcomer is coming and puts a lot of money on the table. So we will have to check that and see how it works. But it is obvious that Erga will go on doing the monitoring uh, we'll do the monitoring to just um, highlight best practices on the implementation, the control, and a whole bunch of different uh, subjects, that, uh, like uh, uh, highlighting the French content. I mean, it's not only knowing that we have a catalog, we also have to see the catalog. What is an independent producer? What are the criterion we're going to uh, use? All these are subjects for ERGA this year. Thank you very much. Indeed, those uh, subjects are right at the heart of our uh, questions. And, um, and, and, and what about this visibility and about this actor that, that puts money on the table, etc.? What about the visibility of those catalog and how to create a common culture, European culture, uh, when the support, uh, the platform supporting that is not accessible, for instance? 
I, you did not completely answer uh, as regards the means of erga. Oh, sorry. I, uh, the, the means of erga are the means of the regulator. We have no public money, so it is the regulators themselves who do the job. And indeed, the multiplication of tasks uh, uh, requested from ERGA will bring about the question of the means very soon. And uh, our European uh, Deputy Member of Parliament, uh, Madame Ferrand, raised the question before because she asked, well, will the regulators have the means? There is a big discrepancy. We have the CELSA, we have the Italian friends and the German ones, etc. They have big money and uh, they will be able to, 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 to do the work. But putting together all the means uh, helps the average regulators like the Belgium CESAR to, uh, to do the job. But the average, uh, uh, the average contribution needs to be uh, increased for the future. So there is a kind of uh, discrepancy of actors, differences, yes, the, the well, because it is difficult for world international multinational groups to to uh, to to be controlled by a european regulator roc olivier if you look at arcom and all the texts arcom is going to be to be uh, reinforced we have regular exchange with CNC. We have access uh, to fiscal um, information, which is very important in terms of obligation and compliance. The uh, uh, platforms are uh, are obliged to communicate the data. Um, and we had a lot of exchange with the platforms, uh, raising questions to collect all the data, which is important for our mission to be made. And uh, in exchange with our partners in Europe hosting those platforms on their uh, ground, and thanks to the uh, memorandum of understanding we mentioned several times, we have this exchange fluidity that helps to share uh, information each time it is necessary, keeping, of course, confidentiality. Uh, that's normal. So as regards France to control the uh, obligation, which is normal for the regulators, uh, the regulator will be uh, will have the weapons necessary to check whether the platforms do or do not respect their uh, obligations. And, uh, and, and then we will have sanctions, we will have fines, we will have, uh, yeah, we will have the possibility to interfere because uh, our uh, capacity to uh, emit um, uh, sanctions uh, is is um, is acknowledged. So we do have this possibility of Europe for Arcom, dear Karin. You will have to Karim. You you will have to get used to that. It is not the CSR anymore. It is Arcom. Okay. Uh, so indeed. There is this obligation, uh, but this whole system can be interesting uh, only for the economic system which stands behind. It is not self-standing. Uh, Karim Bourki has, uh, um, has uh, mentioned this disruption and the uh, coming in of platforms or operators which were traditionally used by classical operators. We could uh, mention Roland Garros or different football, football matches from the first league, etc., etc. Um, we could also uh, mention the consequences for, uh, for the cinema. Um, and so I'm wondering what uh, your point of view is, Delphine Ernaud, for France Television? And what about the assessment and future perspectives in real life of the uh, transposition of this uh, directive? Well, thank you very much. I would like to I would like to speak on behalf of the European uh, point of view for the union of uh, European uh, broadcasters and televisions. 
when I talk with uh, my colleagues, I always look at my and, and check my vocabulary because, you know, France has uh, this cultural uh, sovereignty. So I change that into cultural diversity uh, because I do not want to shock anyone. And of course, I am in favor of this model. And I say that if our French cinema industry is so lively, it is because we have this cultural ex exception. And as a French uh, person, I'm very proud of what we have uh, obtained with those negotiations because I consider that the framework has been modernized. And there are many principles, uh, but real principles, the, uh, the uh, acknowledgement, reward, and the, the uh, fair recognition of different actors, producers, etc., and filmmaker. And as the uh, president of ARCOM said, despite all that, we are flexible. So this is the French cultural exception, which is... Uh, uh, and, and within the European uh, situation, we are not completely far away from the market, but we are not submitted to an only national directive, but we have this kind of flexible interpretation of this directive within the European scope. It is quite remarkable, I must say. And after having exchanged with my partners, I mean, you may, uh, you may joke about the long, long month of negotiation, but the result is there and is uh, satisfying. So while discussing with my partners and uh, what I considered as a French default at the beginning is in fact an advantage. So we, we, we have modernized this uh, universe. <laughs> and if we did that, it is of course because culture in France has a predominating place, but it is also uh, because it is of economic interest. It is an industry. At European level, creative and, uh, and creative and audiovisual uh, and cultural uh, industries in general, con containing also music, etc., that's very strong for Europe. I mean, we export much more than we import of those cultural goods, so it is uh, a good way to create richness in Europe. In France, too, we had a recent study which was made to um, uh, within the political context where we want to get rid of the uh, public tax for television. Um, when you bring in one euro in France Television, you create three euros of, uh, of a GDP for France. Why? Because we have all the uh, employees on the territory, etc. And in particular, because whenever you invest in creation, there are many jobs concerned, many branches. When you shoot a film, a fiction in a city, you create, um, you create economic... Um, uh, uh, side effects for uh, for a city, and uh, the government has also um, mentioned that uh, to encourage to uh, the investment into studios, etc. So, which is going to be uh, organized and steered by the CNC where we are at present time. So it remains a French specificity, but as far as I'm concerned, it is really an important economic sector basis, etc. And then, uh, 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 you know that it's much more than the automotive industry, so it is not a little subject. All this is particularly positive also for economic reasons. Now, if I go back to my position, public service, and being a public service, and within this system, I can only uh, uh, welcome the fact that this system um, is going to be reinforced because the risk is to be pushed aside from different, uh, different events like the sports events, for instance. This is something that worries us. We would like to be careful about being pushed aside and uh, and, and being taken away from the uh, from different uh, events. Fanny Herrero developed for us the 10% series. She is under contract with Netflix, and I very well understand. I congratulate you because she has uh, you have recruited her, and it's fine. 
Unfortunately, it's not possible for us to work with Fanny Herrero anymore, nor with Omar Sy, because it's a pity. I'm, I mean, it's a pure pity, you see? That's it. So we understand that uh, for those big world media, there are means that we do not have at the national level. And this is something that worries me. It is the same for the sports rights. Amazon could really put money on the table that we will never that we will never have and that we not even dream of. So we are put aside by the market. Um, I mean, we, the traditional operators. So we are national. We are not international, but we are an essential pillar for creation in France. France Television, that's 500 million euros per year, cinema and creation. We uh, are very happy that 300 million are coming to increase that, but we should not leave those 500 that we are having for many years now invested in independent creation with this uh, uh, this um, the strive for for independent uh, creation this is something important it's part of our schedule of our specifications and it is important for French creators artists etc so we will see how how it develops. I tend to say that it is not necessarily in my interest to have a free uh, uh, broadcasting of a French series by Netflix. I'm just saying that it's part of my ecosystem. So I sincerely hope that all the actors and participants to this ecosystem uh, will find a fair um, balance. Uh, so that's very important. And um, we have secured 300 million investments in the creation. Maybe we should also secure the 500 million of France Télévisions, the, the existing ones. It's not the case at the present time. We do not know how uh, public service is going to be financed in 2023. So now that we have done all that, we have to change our priorities. Um, uh, listen, I have secured the, the pillars uh, in front of my seat, but I should be careful about the ones for the back of my seat, you know, because if not, I'm going to, to fall off. Well, we will work together. Thank you very much. I think that you have remembered the uh, fair balance between the front feet and the back feet of the chair. Um, maybe the subject that you have uh, touched upon is really at the heart of our uh, business on this uh, fight for talents, fight for talents, the battle for talents, uh, how far the uh, the platforms, what consequences on the ecosystems uh, with the coming up of those um, of those uh, platforms. And then I will hand over to Netflix because Netflix has been mentioned with Omar Sy and Fanny Herrero. Uh, with their uh, exclusiveness or non-exclusiveness contract, we don't know. But just before that, I would like to listen to the point of view of the club of the European producers uh, or the uh, European producers club, Gudni Hummelfall, um, with the uh, this important question on independency in particular. Uh, then the memorandum of understanding on the ERGA uh, side, the uh, code of good conduct which has been set up. And I guess that you, Mrs. Um, Gudni Hummelfall, you, um, you are going to highlight us on those questions. I'd like to. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say that um, it's very important that we have regulations. It's uh, really important. And, uh, uh, and of course, listening to all of you here today and knowing that uh, France is like uh, the best in, in the class. And um, uh, I guess we all would like to be French, if not always, but at least when it comes to producing. Um, it's um, it's really um, 
it's also very important to see that um, it's so different from all the different countries. You know, I come from uh, I come from Norway. It's um, it's a rich country, but it's a low capacity when it comes to language. We're only 500. And if you go to the East European and the other countries, and like my own, we have not implemented this yet. So um, the challenge is that the the world or our industries is you know is changing so fast before you know we get to implement it, and um, we can't change any of those rules. So. Um, I think the regulations that has been tried to or is setting up is very good. But for us as independent producers, I think what we could try to focus on is how it's going to be implemented. You know, what should we focus on and what kind of, you know, uh, European works could be if you live in Slovenia that you only get French or Spanish programs. Should it be anything about language? Should it be that it's produced by independent producers in that country? And of, of course, I understand for some of those dreamers, they can't go into all of the countries. For example, Lithuania has 1.2 million people. You know, it's not that many uh, works like that. But I think if you all sort of focus and help people to see how to implement it and what they order, and it's not just all uh, the European works, I think that could sort of help growing the um, diversity in the cultural um, system of Europe. And um, of course, uh, we as independent producers uh, always think, you know, we are not the most important, but we are in many ways uh, central for, for um, bringing creativity and bringing, um, you know, works and talents and, and driving them. And as a producer, you always have to, you know, develop perhaps 10 works and if you're lucky you finance one and uh, to uh, why we have been working so hard to with this new implement and that we want to have um, uh, we want to have some regulations that we also can keep some of our IPs and I know this is very very difficult and it's changing the whole model of all the streamers because that you know they need it for to do that for for their work but I think that's one of the things we always will fight for but why we also fight for being sort of the uh, keeping this on uh, sustainability um, uh, in our ecosystem and why it's important to have the um, independent producers um, who is not connected directly either to a big TV stations or a streamer or anything like that is that we um, there is such a run for a lot of good IPs. We're almost drying up in Europe, you know, there's uh, uh, and for the small ones, we can't afford to buy the big books that everybody's doing. So we have to try to be more creative and coming up with other stories um, with our authors. So one of my good colleagues once said that if you want to keep the sun uh, sustainability in our ecosystem, you can sort of see it as if you know, the bird, if it's like a forest, the birds are the authors and the flowers are all the, the creations. And then you have the branches with the techni technicians and all the other ones and the producers are the tree. And then you have the IP as the roots. And if you always take away the roots, uh, everything is going, sort of going to die. So that's why um, we always think that we need to fight and see how we can share some of the IP when it comes to the big, um, both uh, the big um, the streamers, but also now um, all the big TV stations who also, uh, you know, start to have the same business model. So it's uh, we need to help each other to create new ways of... Um, building a sustainable and creative uh, European work. So that's sort of one of that tasks. I think I left the question, but yeah. <laughs> no, je, euh, non, je vous remercie, effectivement, c'est la, la... Oh no, thank you very much. It is the question which was right at the heart, which is about independent production and the different subjects that you uh, support and work on. Uh, because indeed, 
there is this code of good conduct, picking up on all the subjects that you have uh, uh, mentioned and illustrated. Uh, so uh, there are two things that probably we need to talk about. It is the fair payment uh, and uh, for the independent producers in proportion, etc. Uh, I mean, you are asking that uh, pro in proportion to the uh, VOD services, etc. Uh, of course, it takes the necessity to be able to assess this uh, public and audience in an independent way. And apart from the payment, there is also the question that you just raised, which is about keeping intellectual property, which is in link with uh, works with this unbalance between the producers and independent producers and broadcasters or platforms that may uh, bring, um, well, problems <laughs> uh, with very uh, concrete questions like the series, uh, when, when, when you have developed uh, one series. Uh, uh, maybe you have uh, tried 10 more, but only one is successful, and you are sometimes obliged to abandon the rights on the sequels and the prequels, uh, which is an abandoning of intellectual uh, property uh, rights. So it means that in now we have those two questions, <laughs> uh, different but important, and on which we may reflect collectively. So payment, uh, public audience and rights, and the other question which uh, had been mentioned by Delphine Arnaud, and which is the fact that, well, according to, uh, regarding the big money uh, which is there, uh, amplified by the platforms, uh, the, the money the platforms inject into creation, uh, as Jean-Baptiste Gourdin was saying, we may very well raised the question about whether the platform are already at 20 or 25 percent of natural contribution. But uh, this is a kind of uh, basis which is organized. Um, however, regarding those sums of money, we could very well fear a kind of, um, well, battle, economic battle, if not war. If 300 million are going to be put in, what is it going to account for? Diversity of films, uh, average budgets, big budgets, small budgets, etc. Or uh, do we maybe we will see and observe the concentration of this money for another kind of uh, films, less films, with uh, talents like Omar Sy or Fanny Herrero, only two examples, but uh, maybe they will repeat in the future. So it is probably too early to make an assessment and to draw final conclusions, but this is, uh, it would be interesting to have your opinion and the Netflix opinion. I think it's, uh, I'll have to see with the, with the streamers coming to Europe, um, it was a great thing, especially for, for producers, you know, contradicting saying why I said earlier, but for us who was lucky and come from uh, low capacity countries, we suddenly could um, do high end uh, series and be shown. And, you know, I produced a, um, um, a series called Occupied, which was very popular here in France, but it was with Arte and TV2, but then uh, Netflix came in and, and acquisition and helped us fully finance it so we could send it out even if it was a uh, um, public broadcasters in both places so that really helps um, you know promote works from small countries I think what we need to find is a sort of a balance that we have um, you know it's not that we always should have everything but have a part or a share is what we're fighting for when we do and especially uh, where we come from, or where I'm, um, you know, um, the Nordics have been very in forefront when it comes to uh, digitalizing. So we have, um, 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 you know, the streamers are actually um, buying a lot from the Nordics, more than it is from France, even if we are s smaller and don't have the same budgets. So, but so I, what we sometimes fear is that, uh, especially some of the younger producer, if they don't mind 
trying to get an IP and build um, a business and uh, take care of the European uh, creation, um, they, we can all just end up um, being in the hands of and, and not being in control on what we're doing. So I guess that's what we're our fight because we we really do appreciate and I do work with the uh, streamers. So it's it's not saying that, but it's uh, we have the same problems with some of the others. But I think. Um, we don't have the bargaining power, even if we have selected a lot of uh, organizations, but I think we need to try to see if that is something we can achieve in the future, that we have um, share some of the IP when it's done. And then I think we will have a more healthy ecosystem in our business. Merci. Alors, effectivement, on a beaucoup entendu. Thank you. We've heard a lot of uh, representatives of uh, production, public services, and regulation. And now you spoke about platforms. Madeleine certainly has her views about that, especially uh, this is forward-looking, but a talent war, will that take place soon or not? And uh, what impact will transposition have in that sense. Well, to be here, um, I hear myself, sorry, <laughs> that's much better. Uh, yes, so lots of questions, very interesting point, thank you so much for that, but uh, maybe we zoom out a bit and give some context, because we are right now in the golden age of content production. There are infinite possibilities for creators and talent right now. You see investments, not just by us, but with many others really ramping up. So giving a lot of opportunities for European content to pop, to grow, to you know, give pleasure and understanding about European content throughout the world. And I think that's a positive. What I can say about our investment as Netflix is that it was for the last three years already four billion. So those are really big numbers and we intend to stay and to go bigger because we think European content is fantastic. We love it and we see that our members also very much enjoy European content. Uh, so we have a very strong incentive ourselves to deeply invest in relation with the producer community because we always partner producer, we always work together with producers and we already work together with over 300 producers in the last few years and we plan to work with more producers, with a diversity of producers. So this is a bit of the context and we're doing that as I think Jean Baptiste was also saying in the beginning, we're not doing that for reasons of regulation, we're doing that because we have a very strong incentive to do so. So I think that's number one. And now number two, if we talk about the audiovisual media service directive, we look at that in a in a, a more uh, broad way. So we speak a lot about Article 13, of course, that's top of mind here, but I also want to point out, for instance, the protection of minors. That was a topic that's always close to my heart in my earlier job as well, where I was the earlier Karim. Uh, uh, and also for Netflix, that's very, very important. Um, we as Netflix also want to be compliant, we want to be a good contributor, we want to be responsive, we want to be responsible. And I think for the protection of minors, a fantastic example is that, and that is before I started at Netflix, is that like already the classification system was upheld uh, voluntarily, although the new AVMSD directive had not started. So I think, you know, that is how we want to operate throughout Europe. And uh, uh, Rock olivier Mestre said also, it's not for nothing that we were the only ones that did sign the media chronology. That is for us very important to lean into what is important to a country and to legislation. So having said that, um, I think if we look at the purpose of the directive, that is very much focused on creating a, a strong single digital market for strong European content. And I think that is really key as a foundation. Country of origin is very important, 
to that and we have to deal with a very strict Dutch regulator that lots of the Netflix people have to talk to, have to respond to all the time and I think that's a good thing because that's a very strong responsibility of all those individual regulators. So country of origin is key, stringent regulators are important to uphold the rules. Then if you look at um, investment obligations, those are of course an exception of the overall country of origin principle. An ex exception that is understandable and is important. At the same time, it should also not distract from the purpose of creating a very strong European content market. So having said that, I think also in the context of this very strong um, uh, uh, market right now where you would see very healthy production and the golden age, you know, if you want to legislate further, if you want to talk about investment obligations, that's all good for us, but we want to point out that it's key for players like us to be able to keep doing what we're doing, and hopefully, uh, goodly, we will be able to do that, that the regulation is predictable, fair, but that also everyone is looking at the effects, because I think some of the topics here that were already raised is like, what will this do to talent scarcity? What will this do to the uh, the, the raising of the level of the cost? And as a member of why we had this directive in the first place, also we want, and um, I know that Commissioner Breton, for instance, finds that also important, EU VOD companies, not Americans, but EU. And if you have to go to all those different systems, then that is very difficult to create those e EU European VOD services. So just a call out for that. And then third thing which is really important for us in this space is that there is flexibility. We need flexibility to be able to work with all different kinds of production companies, different talent, um, and therefore uh, we want as much flexibility as we can. We can work with really large uh, um, independent production companies like Media One that is owned by KK which is an, an American uh, investment uh, company. But we also want to work, for instance, with BFT that created, that's a German, very young, talented producer that created to uh, the show that is called How to Sell Drugs Online for Fast. You know, that is the diversity we want to do. And if, why do we want that? Because we see that people, and that's the advantage of being like, you know, a global player, we see that people love to, to see different kind of content. So the diversity is in our business model. So therefore give us the flexibility to tap into that diversity and thereby create the best possible, uh, uh, well, also in the, in the line of, of the spirit of the AVMSD. So what are we doing also to work on the diversity of, of talent? What we do is we have a program which is called Grow Creative mm -hmm. and where we would work on the pipeline. We, have uh, also different per partnership. I think here we, we partner uh, with uh, Mille, uh, now I have to look, Mille, Mille, Mille Visage and Collective 5050 and as well with Cine Fabrique uh, in Lyon. So that is the way how we also show that our commitment is towards diversity but also very deeply in countries. So just to give you a, uh, like a perspective on what is important for us, diversity is key because that is really what moves the needle for our business. And in that context, we also love to work with public service broadcast. Okay. Again, it is, as you were saying just now, Karim, it's very early days to, to see, you know, the impact of these investment obligations. They have not all been implemented and then it will take a bit of time before you really see the results. I would say, given the unprecedented levels of investment, uh, I would rather see us pause before we tumble into new legislation, see how things work, work out for the market, and also keep an eye on the competitiveness of the European market. And I, I don't have to, uh, to talk in about that too much, but if I say Asia, North Korea, for instance, there's a lot of competition as well. And let me, as, as leading EMEA, you know, be best in class within Netflix that we keep rocking it for European content, right? 
So that's something what I would say is closing off. Like you, we're super committed. We're, we're in. We want to stay. We're in for good for Europe. We would love to work together on with with producers, different producers, different talent, and and make sure that that we have a very sustainable relation. Now I will answer your questions on um, because this context is just necessary for you to understand that if I say this, this is not just lip service, but it's really true. So we want to build sustainable relations with producers all different kinds. So that's one. Two, we, in order to do that, we need absolutely to make these producers happy because otherwise they wouldn't work with us anymore. So therefore, and this is maybe something people do not realize, we own less than a fourth of all the European works the rights to. So it's very small amounts of shows that we actually own the rights to. So that's also maybe good for, for to debunk for once and forever. So we do not take all rights. We have a diversity of different deals we make with producers. In some instances, there will be a, a different deal than in all other distance. It, it really depends on yeah, the kind of producer it is, the country this producer is coming from, if it's a new one, if the producer wants to take risks or not. Uh, so we really have a lot of diversity. Now, Omar Sy, honestly, <coughs> I have to admit something. Mm. I'm in love with Omar Sy. I think he's fantastic. I never met him, although I work at Netflix, which is really frustrating. Omar Sy does not have an exclusive contract with Netflix, nor does um, the, the lady from uh, 10% uh, Ero. Um, uh, they do not have any exclusive deals with us. Of course, they work with us, but that's not exclusive. And I think for Omar Sy, he recently also worked on a, on a movie uh, uh, in, in this summer uh, from uh, 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 France Television. And I will try to state the name. Les Tiraleurs, is that true? That's what I heard? Okay, so this is, yes, sorry for my pronunciation. I'm looking at my team. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so we really, for, for us, it's, it's also not in our interest just to grab talent. We want talent to be there, but it's not just money. People will also work with us if they have the possibility to lean into, you know, to have more decision-making on the final cut, like in the, or for Omar C, for him, it might also be interesting to work a little bit on his own production company. So we are super inclined to be flexible, to understand and to lean into what these talents need and, and then, you know, hopefully create sustainable relations with them. But the fact that we also invest in film schools, in these projects like, like, like uh, I was just talking about, um, uh, like, like thousand, uh, um, I forget again, sorry, that's like I have a blo visage. That is not just for us. We're doing that also for local uh, uh, production companies, local broadcasters, and our compet competitors. Also, you know, the other streaming. And, uh, you know, you talk about Netflix all the time, but be sure we are under a lot of competition. Also, our competitors can then work with that talent. Why do we do that? Are we crazy at Netflix? No, because we want local talent to love to work with us and to do that voluntarily. So that's what I wanted to share. No, merci pour cette réponse uh, extensive, effectivement. Elle... Thank you for that extensive uh, answer covering many topics. So Netflix claims that it does not systematically hold rights and only holds a quarter of rights to European production. And the talent war... La, la guerre des talents, uh, and the talent war isn't there yet. It is still a bit too early. And you don't have exclusive right with Omar C. Well, the future will tell us, because it is true that it's a changing environment in terms of the number of platforms that may emerge on the market, if not the national market, when you see how things are evolving. But I also note you mentioned the golden age for production. I believe that was referred to in the previous panel discussion when speaking about European works, and maybe uh, the finances will realize that, that between cinema and audiovisual in the previous months, production was very strong. We saw that 
for example, and to assist at another panel discussion, it was very complicated to find technicians or access to studios for shooting. There was a lot of bottlenecks around that, pushing prices upwards, if you think in terms of the economy and finance. But we know that with the pandemic, there are many other factors that played a role and impacted the ecosystem. But I believe that Delphine Emmott wanted to say a few words on that. Now, I wanted to say to Madeleine that I find it's great that Netflix, with a, a huge amount of pragmatism, is now a part of the French ecosystem. I was delighted to see your uh, representative at the table signing the chronology with the media. I think that approach on your part wasn't quite natural, and I think it was wonderful. Next, I have two comments. You said it before, and you rightly so, that things will continue to evolve. And we can see and that there's strong competition between the major platforms. We've seen the stock market price of Netflix lost 20% a few days ago. And there'll be a lot of tension on the European market, which is an important market for all the major platforms. So in that respect, this pragmatism it can be justified in a way from an economic perspective. Now, I also note, and I fully understand, your sense of responsibility and your determination to be totally in the ecosystem. But you have the talent war, but there are other forms of inclusions in the ecosystem, as you said rightly. Our colleagues at Arte said that I feel that I'm the ARD of Netflix. Bruno Platino often says you do the season one and season two gets out of your hands. My colleague from TAFE One came back demoralized from a trip to the U.S. That was in the days of the uh, charity bazaar, and it was my, but the Bazaar de la Charité was marked Netflix original. It's not a original, Netflix original movie. For us Europeans, the difference, the basic difference, the fundamental difference, and I remember that it was said before, I like to own what I buy, is that in Europe we consider that what you buy, that will culture, is not owned by the person who buys it, but by its creators. And that's the fundamental difference, actually. So how would you interpret that deep down on a day-to-day -day basis? How will you take into account the fact that 10% is not Netflix original, nor Bazaar de la Charité, and maybe it would be good to leave Occupy on RT in actual fact? That's, uh, those are the very pragmatic questions on a date, uh, in terms of the everyday work. I'm not asking you to answer that, but these are the questions that will be raised. You'd like to answer that? I totally get that, and I must say we're also learning and evolving. What I would say in some instances, we would not work with um, so we would make an ag agreement with a production company that would just not say to us that that is an important part of the deal, right? So in some instances, we did not do that because there was a third party that we dealt with and then we didn't mention the name. But I would say we learn and we are leaning into giving more and more credits to the creatives that we can because we see that is important. So I think... Netflix really is a learning organization, and we can do better in circumstances. We're more aware of it. Be also sure that the, the, the examples you mentioned, it was not a direct relationship, so it was just an agre agreement that was made like that, and thereby it was not part of that deal, right, to have that credit mentioned. Now we will always look very carefully if that is part of the deal. You and I had an earlier conversation, and you flagged that to me. So what would then happen? That is typical Netflix. We would then internally talk about, like, hey, what can we do to improve there? So that's basically it. So yes, fair. It's fantastic content, and we need to give the credits to those that get the credits. But it depends a little bit also on the deal making that happened before, because sometimes there are parties involved that are dealing with us that are not asking those questions to us to give those credits. Now we're more proactively looking into that. But thank you for that. 
Merci. Je vois que les instances nationales et européennes. Uh, national and European bodies would like to step in. Karim, I would like to come back to what Delvin said at one point. It will be good for season one that was financed. If it was successful, for us to be able to keep season two. I also believe that financial flows generated with the implementation of Article 13 should enable national services to continue to discover talents. The private ecosystem must cater to a shareholder. There's a stock market price. Clearly, profitability and profit is key for any private player. Now, the contribution of the private actor to national wealth via taxes should enable the public service and all the stakeholders in the ecosystem to discover those talents. It's not a contradiction, okay, at all. But I'm thinking that discovering talents and this possibility, thanks to this financial flow of not only trying to find the next and to shop, next untouchables, but I would also try to discover talents who may succeed or may fail. It's, an, it's in for the honor of the state to promote young producers, young talents, and to help this ecosystem to grow. Now, when you make money from, uh, thank you, Karen. I think Delphine would like to answer, because one may consider that you'll be privatizing gains, and the public authorities would would have to bear the losses. Perfect summary. I would say it as well as you did, but that's exactly it. You are right. That's really a part of the public service mission, to work with young authors, young talents, and you're perfectly right on that. Now. There is a nuance. Public or private channels are free, open to everyone, not platforms. So be careful. Public money should not finance R&D for the large international media. That's wrong. So that is the difference. You can't compare. I'm not even taking public service. You can't compare TFR with Netflix. They have 14 euros per month on the one hand and nothing on the other. So be careful with that. Between CNC, France Television, and uh, in a way, advertising that is partly financed by French companies, after all, it is uh, national money. Olivier? I'd just like to say a few words because we're in the French presidents of the European Union. It's important to say, to commend the efforts made by the European Union in the cultural areas. That wasn't always the case. It's been many years that I've been interested in this. For years, Europe made everything difficult when it came to culture. You would go to Europe to defend our support mechanisms. There were initiatives such as the AVMS, protecting our cultural exception, increasing copyright. This year, there were important negotiations in relation to the systematic players in the internet. I'm thinking of DSAs and DMAs, the great initiative by the European Commission to defend the independence of media in Europe. Let us commend the maturity of the European Union, which is a great opportunity. That's my first observation. And it, it advocates for one being European today. My second comment, Madeleine spoke about the golden age for creators and producers. It is truly a golden age ahead of us. And what's fortunate with this platform is that there is competition. We don't have a simple monopoly. We have extremely powerful players, but that are competing with each other. So I believe that it guarantees significant investments, dynamic investments, but diversified investments above all because regulations impose that. And their model, their very own model, and their very own profitability will require that. And I'm not sure that we'll have a mainstream offer 
on these platforms. I believe that quite the opposite. What I wager is that you'll have an increasingly diversified offering. I fully agree with Delphine in what she said. Defending our cultural model, our uh, national and European cultural exception requires protecting our national players. Public, dear Delphine, of course, you know that we'll always be your side to defend public services and the singularity of its financing, that is often said by regulators, but also to support our private players against uh, the spectacular changes of the landscape we are in. The consolidation we have seen in the United States for some time now, and what we have discussed uh, this afternoon proved this. We're in a changing world at a fast pace in terms of form of broadcasting, formats, and uses, and the players must also adapt, be able to adapt to this world, and we must support them in that change, be it public or private. Thank you so much. We're coming almost to the end of our panel discussion. And now, a last presentation by Jean-Baptiste. Well, first of all, to say that I agree with Madeleine when I said that we had decided to go, well, to defend the independent uh, production, we knew that it was necessary to have several models. And it is obvious that, uh, uh, I mean, independent production uh, is 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 normal i mean even if you if you later on uh, decide to renounce to your rights so and then the second we need to be careful uh, uh, about things because indeed it's not the end of the story it's changing extremely quickly we're going to have newcomers we're going to have actors being on one model and just to, to we're going to switch to another one etc so we should not believe that the situation is fixed for the future uh, but then, as regards the uh, country of origin, I understand what Madeleine says, and we are we all stick to this objective, which is the one of this unique uh, European market, etc. But if the principle of uh, origin countries has defavorized uh, startups, we would know about it. And second, as regards uh, catalog and quotas. What we heard about, like this risk for fragmentation, etc., is not really convincing because, I mean, the catalogs are fragmented for many, many, many reasons, uh, territoriality of rights, etc. So it is not something that you can uh, uh, apply to that. But this rule of 30% quotas, that's almost... I mean, you can almost forget about it because it's not the availability of European works. It is the uh, visibility of those works, which is at question. Uh, algorithms, recommendation, etc. You know, it is extremely complicated. It is protected by the secret of business, etc. But here I create a link with another subject which is not part of this roundtable, but it is important. It is also the service of a general interest. Uh, services of, of general interest. And this is not so much linked to platforms anymore. It's about the interfaces, which uh, are much more structuring for the future. So will we tomorrow have the possibility to have access to the diversity of services? And what kind of service will it be? Maybe tomorrow we're going to have aggregators who are going to squeeze editorial brands. And this is even... Uh, of more of major importance. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Baptiste. Um, it's uh, an interesting uh, conclusion, and I see the uh, president of the CNC is going to speak in a few words to uh, conclude this day looking at me. Uh, I could not take the questions from the public, uh, but we received a few of those joining what you just mentioned, algorithms, data, uh, what is going to be the role of the regulator and aggregator. So it is work in progress, but it seems that that our uh, public is interested in that, plus the European quotas. So to sum up, um, 
but I'm not going to repeat what has been said. First of all, we had a very interesting and and rich uh, debate. Maybe we will have uh, one day a, a roundtable on the uh, interest of uh, uh, those uh, services of general interest. But you see that all the questions that which were raised today lead to uh, saying that the French model seems to be balanced and that... Um, and that financing cinema and not only a series of French production and not only English speaking independent and not independent, etc. This is major. And then you may move on, move, move and do some fine tuning and choose whatever you want to do. Uh, and things are going to change. Uh, and I may answer even the last question of our public. When... Uh, when is the next uh, uh, when is the the next AVMS directive going to be released well we just have first of all to deal with this one before speaking about the next one thank you very much for your presence thank you